Crowley, Benson, Jack, Braun, Captain Flint, Brain Trust, Earl Sanderson, Silver Helix, Chop Chop, Young Troll, Stopwatch, Will and Wisp, Turtle, and Xavier Desmond. Hello, welcome to Card Table. Uh, so I talked about 11 last time. Uh, I mentioned right at the end that there are some things about Volume 11 that I maybe wanted to come back to and re-explore. Um, possibly I'll get Greg back on and we can talk about some of that stuff. But for now, I'm just kind of doing kind of an overview of each book. As I mentioned last time, I just decided to shake up the order a little bit. So I did Volume 11, Dealer's Choice, last time. So this, this week, we'll do Volume 10, um, uh, Double Solitaire, which, like I mentioned, is the payoff to the uh, cliffhanger um, after Dealer's Choice kind of resolves everything with the rocks and the jumpers. Um, volume 10... There's still one more jumper out there. <laughs> uh, although, actually, I guess if you read Volume Eleven, um, there is, there, there are three theoretically still. There still could be many jumpers out there. The one uh, Molly Bolt is the one who uh, kind of gets away, and so she's the one where theoretically there's still one more jumper out there. Um, I personally kind of have always hoped that uh, that um, Molly Bolt would that Chris Claremont would come back to write Molly Bolt since Claremont created Molly Bolt in the first place, but. Uh, just based on a few comments I've seen by, from both George R. R. Martin and Chris Claremont, I don't think Claremont's ever going to be returning to Wild Cards, unfortunately, um, which makes me sad. But as far as the jumpers who are still an active threat, uh, they're all pretty much neutralized uh, over the course of Dealer's Choice. But there's one left, Blaze, the grandson of Tachyon, who has captured... Uh, or, or kidnapped or just seized uh, Tachyon's living spacecraft uh, baby and uh, used its uh, warp drive. I, I don't think they call it, I think they call it, I want to say ghost drive maybe in, in wild cards, uh, but is warping out to the planet Tachys and um, uh, is going to uh, wreak some havoc once, once he's returned to Tachyon's home world. Um, this is a solo novel written by Melinda Snodgrass, um, the the first wild card solo novel, the first of three so far. And I don't, I get the impression there might not be any more solo novels, um, because um, just because the the stable of wild cards authors has grown so large, and I think George R. R. Martin wants to include as many of them in each book as possible. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know that there's room on the docket for more solo novels, even though there are a couple authors. That I'd love to see see them give a try to a wild card solo novel. I have no idea whether these authors I'm thinking of would want to, but uh, there are a couple who, uh, when I hear their names or when I think of them, I'm like, well, they'd be good. They'd be good doing a solo one, but it probably won't happen. Uh, so anyway, Melinda Snodgrass writes the first wild card solo novel about her character, Doctor Tachyon, the Attackus. The whole planet and culture is all created by her, I believe. In it might be in, in Double Solitaire. It, it, probably, it must be. Hey? I think she thanks Vic Milan for uh, contributing some, some ideas to, to the conception and creation of, of, of Tekesian culture that we see in such, uh, uh, in such, uh, uh, full, full, such, a, such a full portrait of in, in Double Solitaire for the first time. Uh, of course, Volume 2 had, had a story that I love where uh, uh, Tachyon's rival... Uh, Zab comes from Tachys, and there's a whole Tachyon versus Zab. Uh, Zab sort of, uh, again, if you were to go into comic book terminology, Zab is kind of conceived as Tachyon's sort of arch, arch enemy, arch nemesis kind of guy. Um, so we got a bit of Tachesian culture through that story with Zab back in volume two. But after that, really, really nothing. So this is really the first really... Um, full picture of, of this element of the Wild Cards universe that's always kind of just been in the background, something we knew existed, but didn't see much of. In that sense, it's it's definitely a departure. Um, you know, Wild Cards is a science fiction series, but it's um, urban sci-fi doesn't feel like the right term, but it, it certainly is science fiction that's kind of set in, in you know, the, the, the dirty alleyways of New York City. Uh, you know, 80s, <laughs> back when New York City truly was kind of dirty and, and disgusting, right? Back in the, back in the mid 80s. Um, so I guess, I guess, I guess urban sci-fi is kind of the right thing. But, um, but you know, it's science fiction set, you know, in, in, the, in the real world, as it were. Um, 
it's not Star Trek. Uh, but Volume 10 it kind of is Star Trek. Melinda Snodgrass, at the same time as this book came out, I think was working as the uh, s senior staff writer or senior story editor or head, head writer. I don't remember what her title was, but um, you can certainly watch uh, any, any end credits of any season three episode of Star Trek The Next Generation and check that out. But she was pretty much kind of running the, running the show on the story side of Star Trek The Next Generation um, and writing several episodes. And this kind of, you know, you could, you could almost imagine this book uh, if it were to be translated to live action, you could almost imagine it in that Star Trek The Next Generation aesthetic. <laughs> you know, it's got that kind of thing. One fortunate element uh, that, that was established right at the start is that Tekesians are genetically identical to humans. That's, uh, that's actually a plot point uh, on like pretty much page one of the first Wild Cards book. So you don't need any kind of weird explanation for why they go to this alien planet and everyone just looks like humans. Um, that's already built in. So uh, that, that's kind of a nice thing that they can sidestep that. Uh, but it certainly, again, puts you in mind of Star Trek, right? Where most of the aliens they visited <laughs> just look like human people. Um, so that's one element that kind of gives it, a, uh, to me anyway, kind of a Star Trek flavor. So it's, it takes a, uh, it's like a 400 page book. I think it takes about 100 pages before, before uh, Tachyon finds a way to get to uh, Tachis. Um, and there's there's a lot of maneuverings uh, involving the network who were uh, I can't remember. I know I, I've written an art, uh, uh, article for Tor.com um, that I, I'm pretty happy with. It might be my favorite of my Tor essays, uh, but it's about the about the network and how much I I love them, even though we've seen very little of them. And uh, I, I sort of end that article kind of begging the authors to do a full network story, um, which I know was in the works at one point. Um, and maybe will still happen, um, but every so often the network show up, right? In Wild Cards, they in, in Volume Two, and then and now here in Volume Ten. So the network is instrumental in getting Tachyon to Tachis to deal with uh, the, the 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 chaos that is sort of being sown by Blaze's presence on that planet. Um, I mean, the book the book gets you to Tachis right away because Blaze kind of gets there right away. Um, but then Tachis gets there about or, uh, Tachyon gets there about a hundred pages later. He brings two aces with him, uh, Jay Ackroyd and Captain Trips, or Captain Trips, uh, two two fan favorites I think, and two huge favorites of mine. Um, I mean, Captain Trips and Jay Ackroyd are well. Captain Trips is literally my single favorite Wild Cards character. Uh, and I love everything about him. I think Melinda Snodgrass uh, writes him beautifully. Uh, of course, he's the original creation of Vic Milan, but uh, I think Snodgrass has always had an affinity for the character as well. Uh, by contrast, I, I've, I've always felt this about, I, I may have even said this before, I've always kind of felt like Jay Aykroyd never quite works unless it's, unless it's George R. R. Martin who created him. If When Martin writes him, he's just so, he's so witty. I, I feel like it's... I, I feel like it's challenging to write a witty character because you have to, you know, you have to, and, and, and make him seem like truly, you know, and not, not, not make it seem contrived. Like, well, of course the writer can set up, you know, set up situations where the guy gets handed the straight lines and then, you know, the writer has time to formulate something for, for the witty character to say. Um, so I, I think there's a bit of magic and alchemy involved in, in, uh, weaving that spell over a reader and, and making me read it and go, oh my God, Jay Ackroyd is so witty and so clever. How does he come up with these great comebacks on the fly? You know, rather than you know, rather than being able to step back and uh, the writer just contrived situations to make the character be witty. Um, but I think Martin is capable of kind of uh, performing that magic trick um, and really in getting you so invested that you find yourself going, man, this guy's hilarious. Like. What a witty, clever, funny guy. Um, and I think Jay Ackroyd's wit is really one of the appealing aspects of him. And I, I, I just feel like when other writers do it, they don't weave the spell for me, I guess. Um, so even though it's it, it's always still kind of fun to have Jay Ackroyd show up, I feel like George R. R. Martin is really the only one to really make that character sing for me. But it's still kind of cool that he's around. Uh, you know, he's a fun addition to the cast. Um, but for me... Uh, a big part of like for me the character that I, I i find myself most rooting for and most invested in over the course of double solitaire is captain trips 
aka Mark Meadows, uh, him and um, also a Tekijan, one of the one of the the, the bad guys, uh, Derg Derg et Marak, one of the Tekijan bad guys who was created by Victor Milan. Uh, again, showed up during that Zab story in Volume Two, um, and uh, is a is a really great character. There's some great stuff with Derg in Volume Nine as well, and uh, and uh, I love the way Snodgrass portrays him over the course of Double Solitaire. So he's another one. Uh, he, him and Captain Trips, two two of the Milan creations. I think I've mentioned before that Vic Milan is my favorite Wild Cards contributor. So. Uh, seeing his creations in this book is nice, and I think Snodgrass uh, really does them justice. The overall story, I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, convoluted. It's maybe too harsh a word, but it's a little well, it's a little convoluted. Once you get into this book with all the Tekijan intrigues uh, and um, uh, just the the sort of back and forth, sort of backstabbing. Um, the, the way Tekijan society is conceived for this book is that they there's um, different uh, it, uh, it's feudal right if that's the right word uh, you know different different sort of houses uh, these this sort of uh, aristocratic or, or you know the nobles are, are sort of lording it over the the, the you know the plebes the the, the common man uh, and that that some of that's established again right in the in the early early text of volume one um that there's this sort of aristocracy 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 that's a tough word to say <laughs> an aristocratic milieu milieu uh you know and and it's established that the those those higher ups those nobles um are uh, the ones with superpowers or or the telepathy or telekinesis all mental abilities there's, there's no one like what the wildcard virus creates where they can, you know, shoot fire from their hands or lasers or anything of that, but they can read minds or they, you know, they can read thoughts. They can control minds. They can, you know, maybe, you know, do some, some, some telekinetic type stuff. Um, meanwhile, the, the lower class, the Tarheji, I think they're called is the, is, <laughs> I can remember some of the Tekijan actually, but like the Tar, Tarheji uh, is like the common, the, the, the plebeian, the plebeians who are just, um, normal humans like you and me, right, where they have no superhuman powers or anything, and so, um, and so it's sort of Blaze sort of comes along and, and essentially foments a, a revolution amongst that amongst the lower classes, which is kind of a classic, you know, obviously theme throughout history, right? So, uh, the 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 idea, sort of part of the the, the novelty of the premise of the book is that um, even though that's such a common theme in the the true history of of we earthlings uh both in the wild cards universe and just in the real world uh has this long history of, of those types of worker revolutions and revolts the the gimmick is that on tachis the planet tachis it's never happened before it's just not it's just not in their dna somehow it just never it never happens partly because um of that added element of the fact that um, the upper class in Antakis, they don't just have more wealth and power, they also actually have superpowers. And so uh, that's that's maybe created this sort of extra obstacle against the worker revolts and revolutions on this planet. And so so it takes somebody who, like Blaise, who um, was actually, you know, raised by French revolutionaries and, you know, has a, a, a you know, has a very... Uh, uh, detailed understanding of of you know particularly that that sort of like you know um communist revolts and stuff because he was actually raised by french communists so so that's that's sort of the, the the clever hook of the book is that um uh he sort of uh becomes the first demagogue in in Tekijan history the other part of that that they they touch touch on a little bit in the book is uh is the fact that um Telepathy, the fact that telepathy is a thing on this planet means uh, how can you be, a, how can you really be a demagogue? Like, how can you be a lying petition, politician like on Earth? That's just, uh, you know, par for the course. Like, we just sort of accept it now without even thinking that politicians lie. Uh, it's just a cliche because it's so absolutely 100% true. <laughs> um, but on a planet where people can read minds, how do you have lying politicians, right? So, um, you know, Blaze, who is part Tekijan, um and part 
human has like just this perfect mix of DNA to uh, to introduce the, the the very notion of demagoguery to uh, uh, an entire planetary populace that is just doesn't even have a word for that. Tachyon comes back to uh, her house, um, uh, the the Tachyon house. Um, Zab comes back the, that I mentioned before. Um, and, and then there's like power struggles of who's going to be the new leader of the house because technically it should be Tachyon, but uh, Tachyon is uh, not not only in the body of a female but in the body of a, a pregnant female, and because Blaze impregnated her, and so um, Tachyon society has all these rules about the the the, the treatment and, and place of of a pregnant woman because it's a very you know. Uh, regimented society in terms of, of, of gender roles. Um, like Greg mentioned, I think, in, in our video, that there are uh, uh, gen, uh, biological determinists in their, in their outlook. And so uh, women, you know, do this and men do this. So, you know, there's uh, an, obviously opportunities where Snodgrass can kind of commentary, co comment on, you know, sexism and uh, um, all kinds of themes that she can sort of touch on through this story, you know, with, with the politics, demagogues, you know, the, the lying politicians, but also, you know, sexism, patriarchy, all that stuff. So there's a lot, there's a lot in there um, amongst, amongst this sort of uh, um, soap opera, Star Trek-y, uh, alien sci-fi yarn, you know. Like I say, if, if I was to, if I were to level uh, a complaint against it, I think I would say that the some of the Tekesian intrigues become so so intricate um, that they sort of lose uh, the intriguingness <laughs> that intrigue should have <laughs> by definition. Uh, sometimes it just gets so, uh, you know, you thought it was this, but then it was this, but then it was this, um, that sometimes you start to just sort of, you know, it, you know, like like with anything, when it when there's too much of it, it becomes a little bit of white noise. Um, <laughs> I, I think I might have mentioned this before, but they, they, Rick Milan, when he does his solo novel uh, a couple books later, uh, he's got this great line where he kind of lampshades the, the, the just sheer frequency of, of the betrayals within this house and, and the backstabbing and power plays and just, just how constant it is in, uh, in, over the course of Devil Solitaire. So in his book, which is from the perspective of Mark Meadows again, who was on Tacus right, during double solitary uh where he talks about um uh, it's a great line I, I won't be able to quote it perfectly but i can paraphrase it where he where he says that uh intrigue is like a, another element on tachis um so it's earth air fire water and skullduggery i've always loved that line <laughs> it's always just jumped out at me that one line almost perfectly pays off some of the some of the ridiculous sort of Overdetermined intrigue of, of double solitaire, but um, but like with most wild cards books, as I mentioned last time, uh, everything pays off in the end. I think Snodgrass is really good with plot, and so she really um, knows how to move the different, you know, take these pieces and maneuver them in the right way so that that everything pays off at the end. And um, what I was doing, I think I mentioned, I know I mentioned in one of the earlier videos that I that I've put together this kind of timeline of of events in wild cards. And so I, I found myself when I was putting together this timeline of things that happen, uh, I found myself more carefully kind of pulling Double Solitaire apart um, f just for the purpose of summarizing it for this document that I wanted to keep. So um, it's partly just to help with my with my kind of fading memory so that <laughs> sometimes when a new Wild Cards book comes out, I feel like I have to reread all of them just to be like, Okay, where 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 did where, where, where did everybody leave off uh, at the end of these other books? Because um, you know, the, with all these recurrent characters who sometimes don't show up in every book, I get to a new one and I'm like, ah, let's see, where were they the last time? Last time we saw them. So I'm keeping the timeline document for that partly for that purpose. So so I try to kind of summarize the events of every story and in just in wanting to summarize accurately all the crazy double dealings of double solitary <laughs> all the other crazy backstabbings and, and betrayals and, and politicking that goes on over the course of double solitaire uh wanting to get that all correct uh i found myself kind of 
reading it more carefully than I have in some of the past rereads. And it does all fit together nicely. Um, I think there there is something a little confusing. Maybe conf confusing is the wrong word, but uh, there's something a little bit impenetrable at times. I think for at least for me, as the first time I read it, as a, when I was younger, and even when I reread it as an adult the first time, um, maybe it's just that it's kind of overwhelming because it is like a full like in a series that part of it. Part of the appeal of the series is that it just takes place, you know, in the real world, and it's just superhumans in a real world. But this one is people in 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 an alien world, you know. So every every city name is unfamiliar, you know. Every every character name is made up of syllables and letter combinations that are you know there to seem alien, you know, with one or two exceptions where maybe there's like some some weird cognates happening. Um, Usually every single character name is like, you know, has no association for, for a person, right? It's just, uh, and, and maybe people who are used to fantasy literature are used to that. For me as a reader, I, I know for a while it was like, so which character is which? And, um, you know, which ones are important and who am I supposed to be following? Um, but it does all hang together. That's what I found when I did, when I summarized it for my, for my own personal purposes for that, for the timeline document I was creating. Um, and there's a lot there uh, that can be pulled out of it. And uh, and some of the action sequences are really great. Anything involving Captain Trips is great. Um, we get a little more of the network, like I was mentioning before. Who um, I always have time for the network. I think they're such a cool concept, and I want to see more of them. Um, and it does it does pay off the whole Blaze thing, you know, which was kind of the last loose end, major loose end from the Rocks Triad, or what they call the Rocks Triad. It's really one story it's not really a triad because it's 8, 9, 10, and 11 but triad tetrad whatever you want to call it uh, but that whole saga um, you know Blaze was kind of the, bet, the last major loose end and uh, along with Tachyon being sort of stuck quote unquote in a, in a, in a body that wasn't his body um, so all of that is essentially resolved um, or I mean it is resolved um, well yeah, with 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 one or two lingering questions that still twenty books later still haven't been answered. But um, much like the 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 return of the network, which I would love to see, um, I would imagine that they, if they were to do a return of net, return of the network, they would also return to Tachis a little bit, Tachyon. Um, and I guess that's the other thing worth mentioning before I wrap up this video is that um, Tachyon is like the one character in Wild Cards. Um, maybe the only one who uh, is made is present in all ten books of the first ten, um, and 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 a major character in all ten. I mean, really, um, I guess Volume Seven is the only one where he has more of a supporting role. But in every other book in the series, and he's still there, um, and he still does some important things. But um, certainly in the first six books, and then in eight, nine, and ten, he's always a major figure. He is sort of like the face of Wild Cards. He's the guy who's on the cover of most editions of Volume One, and um, he's he's Mister Wild Cards. He's he's a tent pole character, and they make the bold choice at the end of Volume Ten to really write him write him off uh, or, or write him out of the series. Um, and except in flashbacks, he hasn't really been seen much since then. And even f even in when they do the flashbacks, he's he's not, often not there. Um, so that was an interesting choice and, and kind of one of the first examples uh, of of demonstrating the series sort of resiliency and its ability to just kind of go as a saga um, and you know continually reintroduce or continually introduce new characters as as you know the early characters, sort of the first generation of Wildcards characters, their arcs play out and conclude. And rather than just milking them, those characters are just written out of the series, um, only to return maybe as as you know guest stars or supporting supporting characters after that. Um, uh, and it um, so going forward, no more Tachyon. Um, and uh, I think I think I think it they proved with that move that that they could do it and 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 have it be uh, you know not not a, a handicap. Uh, if anything, really the opposite. You know giving the series a sense of uh, longevity um, almost almost like almost like like a, <laughs> a literary law and order 
you know, a show that was on for 20 years and, you know, none of the original cast was was part of it in the latter part because they would constantly sort of move a character out, move a new character in. Um, so, yeah, Wild Cards is like a sci-fi, sci-fi book, the sci-fi literary analog to Law and Order in that way. Also, uh, I believe one last Star Trek reference, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that there's a bit in the ending that I think is a little homage, nod to uh, Spock's brain, <laughs> one of the one of the notorious episodes of, of of the original Star Trek series. I could be wrong. I could be reading too much into it, but I feel like Snodgrass put in a little, a uh, little jokey, little or not so jokey nod. I won't spoil it, but I'm pretty sure it's meant to be a little uh, tip of the hat. So that's that, uh, uh, and I'll see you next time on uh, Card Table. So my honey and me go to a counselor to try and give our love back some sparks. He said, we'll get your love growing. But before we get going, may I highly recommend Card Sharks? I like to go out dancing. My baby loves a bunch of authors. Lately we've had some friction, because my baby's hooked on shared world fiction. Aristocracy.